that this baby might not even get the chance to grow up to 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 begin school because uh, an AI catastrophe comes between. This is really really worrying, but that's the kind of the time frame uh, that 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 we're looking at right now. A warm welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm Johan Landgren. I hope you're great. Today I'm joined by the leading AI thinker, Professor Ulle Hegström. He warns that if humanity does not start taking AI risks more serious and prepare for so-called AI alignment, we may face human extinction in only seven years. Yes, you heard right, in only seven years. But not the way most people may think. And we can still avoid this nightmare. But first, we must understand how it can happen. You definitely don't want to miss this episode. I hope you like it. And if you do, don't forget, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And share your thoughts in the comment section below. And I have many more inspiring guests coming up, including the CEO of Hart Aerospace, developing the largest hybrid electric plane and the leader behind the world's largest sailing vessel, Oceanbird. So stick around. This is the Evolution Show. Welcome back to the Evolution Show, Professor Ole Hegström. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Yeah. Uh, you were on the show about two years ago and we talked about AI risks and your fantastic book Thinking Machines or Tänkande Maskiner. And today we're picking up where we left off and I would like to make an update simply what have happened since we talked last time. And we both know it's a lot. Uh, so I just jump straight into the discussions about AI risks to humanity, big and small and also obscure ones in our part one of our discussion. And uh, so I start off with a very interesting quote you have in one of your lectures. And it's by the American AI researcher Eliezer Yudkovsky. And uh, he says that AI does not hate you, nor does it love you, but you are made of atoms, which it can use for something else. Could you uh, uh, briefly explain why this quote is important to understand when we look at AI risks? Yes, uh, I mean, the point of the Yudkovsky quote uh, is uh, to somewhat demystify AI risk, because uh, uh, many people, when they hear about catastrophic AI risk, they think that it means that somehow mysteriously the uh, AI would turn evil and would want to exterminate humanity or whatever uh, for that reason. And what Yudkowsky points out is that this is not at all necessary. Uh, all that's needed is that the AI has a goal, which is it, it's optimizing for. And this is a typical property that, that uh, uh, any sufficiently advanced AI is likely to have. Uh, a goal that uh, is uh, different uh, from uh, human values uh, and human goals. Uh, so it's not the goal of creating human welfare and human flourishing and, uh, and so on. If, if the AI has a different goal, then we will typically end up in a situation where the world is full of resources, we want this, these resources for creating human welfare and human flourishing, and the AI wants these resources uh, for uh, something else. And the prototypical, somewhat cartoonish example that Yudkovsky and others often come back to is if the AI has the goal of maximizing paperclip production. And in such a case, it will want to uh, use um, if, if it attains, uh, as long as it's um, uh, a low capability AI, uh, it's not going to be dangerous. We, we can run a paperclip factory in this way and it's going to be okay. But when it becomes superhumanly uh, intelligent, uh, there's uh, a risk that it will just want to go on and on and, and produce 
more and more paper clips turn all the matter uh, in the world into paper clips. And um, that would then include uh, the matter that constitutes you and me and all other humans. So that's the point of saying that you are made of atoms uh, that it can use for something else. Uh, we, this is the type of conflict that we absolutely do not want to end up with uh, against an opponent that is uh, m more intelligent and more capable uh, than ourselves. And um, Yudkovsky's view, which I uh, mostly share, is that the default situation, unless we take extreme care in uh, the construction of the first uh, super highly capable AI, uh, is going to be that we have this kind of discrepancy uh, between our goals and, uh, and uh, the AI's goals. The vast majority of all possible goals out there uh, are, are going to be different uh, from anything we can even remotely recognize as human goals. So this is going to be the default uh, outcome, uh, unless we're really, really successful with aligning the AI's goals with others. And, and this generates uh, the, the, the basic AI risk that uh, Yudkovsky and others are talking about. And uh, more and more people, they talk about advanced AI tools and uh, new milestones by tech companies such as OpenAI, Google and so on. But you have recently warned that the concept of artificial general A intelligence, AGI, it encourages several fallacies like, oh, look how this uh, robot falls and it can't walk or talk properly and it can't make its own decisions. And then surely AGI must be a long way off. But you argue that this is a very misleading way to look at it. So could you please explain why? Well, um, so, so several different definitions of AGI have been proposed over the years. But the most common one and the basic one is to say AGI is an AI that doesn't just have a single specialized kind of uh, intelligence, such as being extremely good at chess or uh, being able to drive a, a car safely in city traffic or something like that, but rather has human level or superhuman level uh, competence across all uh, the, the different uh, cognitive uh, capabilities uh, that we humans have. And in some contexts, that has been a really good uh, generator of, of, of illustrative examples and discussions and so on. But I think that uh, um, overly, uh, overly focusing on this concept of AGI invites a fallacy whereby you point to the failure of an AI to achieve something that you and I as humans uh, can achieve. And there are lots of, of, of such stuff around. Um, uh, pointing to, to such a failure uh, uh, by the AI uh, and concluding that, oh, if the AI cannot even do that, then, then AGI is uh, far away and therefore we don't need to worry about these huge existential catastrophic AI scenarios. And I think that the mistake here uh, is to to think that AGI in this literal sense of performing at least as well as humans across all the, the many, many dimensions of intelligence and capabilities before anything dangerous can happen. And I think that that's, that's just a mistake. And, and if you compare a human to an AI, such as comparing me personally, my intelligence to the intelligence of GPT-4, who is the most intelligent? Well, the answer is that it depends on what aspects of uh, intelligence that you emphasize. I am better than GPT-4 at some things. It is better than me uh, at other things. Uh, so it depends. So we are already in a situation where, like in a head-to-head -head fight uh, between me and GPT-4, 
it's not super clear who would win, or it depends on exactly uh, what the game is. And if the game is uh, take charge of the world, well, there are a, a, a bunch of capabilities that are especially relevant for that. And the question is not when has the AI uh, overtaken humanity across all possible capabilities, but rather when uh, ha has it become smarter than us in a sufficiently broad spectrum of these particularly important capabilities for, for power seeking? And that doesn't need to include uh, ev everything. We don't, uh, it, it's not necessarily crucial for an AI to be able to tie a shoelace reliably in order to take over the world. It can do without that, uh, probably. But, but, but if you're too stuck on the AGI concept and you see that the uh, present state uh, robotics hasn't yet solved the problem of reliably tying a shoelace, tying your shoes. Uh, it, it's easy to to draw the mistaken or over hasty conclusion that that uh, we are far away from anything uh, dangerous um, being possible. Okay, so what are these uh, especially relevant capabilities? Uh, and I would say that language here. Maybe we will come back to this, but 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 I'll just point out that I think that that's an extremely important uh, tool for achieving, like most everything in the world. Uh, so uh, yeah. with the last few years, very, very rapid development in large language models, we're heading towards something that 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 may be quite dangerous. Yeah, and and uh, I can just add to that. I thought of something when you said that. That I think it, we have one of the issues now. It some people that are very very optimistic about the AI future or the AI development right now. They may they may just say that yeah, as you said, it's it's a uh, chat GPT four. They are just language models, uh, models. So they kind of diminish um, the potential threat or the potential importance. As you, as you said, intelligence is in many ways languages or the way we can use languages be it mathematics or i mean logic and so on is also a language in a way um, and or, or other ways to communicate to to affect to achieve different goals so I, I think that it's important to understand the importance of as you say languages but we'll come back to that i'm just going to say uh, for people who are not so familiar with maybe what what's the difference between narrow AI and maybe, you know, the big step AGI. Could you just elaborate a little bit for people who are not so familiar with this world? Yeah, uh, it's a very common thing to, to, to do this uh, contrast between na narrow AI and uh, uh, AGI. Um, so narrow AI is, is the kind of thing that can only play chess or can only drive a car in city traffic or, or such things. And if we had had this conversation, say, three or four years ago, I would probably have said that all the AI that we have seen so far uh, are examples of narrow AI. Uh, but now that we have such uh, strong uh, large language models uh, with GPT-4 and uh, Anthropics Claude 3 uh, as probably the, uh, the most powerful uh, examples, uh, we we have a situation where, I mean, in a sense, GPT-4 can only produce language. And, and you could uh, claim that, okay, that makes it a narrow AI because producing language is, is just uh, one particular task. But I claim that this task involves uh, so many other uh, different tasks. If you think, think at about what you are doing in your daily life to affect the world in, in various ways. Yeah, the more you think about it, the more you will probably realize how large a fraction of this is done through language acts, such as uh, producing, producing uh, new episodes of the evolution show when you say things in order to try to 
influence your listeners in, in, in various directions. This is the same thing as I'm doing in my teaching or when I write research reports or, or I even write um, for popular magazines and newspapers and so on. All these things are language acts and these are ways in which I influence the world. There are exceptions. I do gardening sometimes or cooking. I do stuff with my hands. But I think that the really uh, big ways in which I'm capable of influencing the world goes through uh, language acts. Uh, and, and this is why I think that that it would be actually wrong to call GPT an insult to GPT-4 to, to call it uh, a narrow AI. It's not quite AGI either in the sense that we talked about of having literally all the capabilities uh, uh, of humans at human level or higher. It doesn't have that, but it's somewhere in, in uh, a kind of gray area between narrow AI and, and uh, AGI. And my previous point about AGI being somewhat a misleading concept uh, is basically that per perhaps things, things are likely to, to uh, turn dangerous already somewhere in this uh, gray area where the AIs are good at not literally everything that humans are good at, but at enough things. And, and there are a bunch of uh, capabilities that are especially important uh, for um, uh, power-seeking behavior, trying to take control of the world. And the important thing, if you uh, worry about AI takeover, is uh, whether AIs are good at a broad enough spectrum of that kind of properties. And I, I think that that includes a lot of uh, language uh, capabilities. Another core concept um, is the problem with so-called AI alignment. Um, can you tell us about, about that? Yeah, so uh, given uh, the problem we talked about in connection with the Eliusia Yudkovsky quote about AI um, seeing us as made out of atoms that it can use for something else, what that brings to light is the importance of uh, the AI having uh, goals that are compatible with what we want. And, and uh, AI alignment is all about aligning the uh, goals and drives and values of the first uh, super intelligent uh, machines with uh, whatever it is that we uh, want, with our values. That's AI alignment. And, and uh, if we succeed with AI alignment, if, if we uh, create superhumanly intelligent AIs uh, that want the same thing that we want uh, in terms of creating a better world for everybody, a, a world where, where we can all, a world full of uh, love and joy and so on for all humans, then I think that that's uh, probably something we can achieve. We can solve all our uh, mundane present day problems about climate and natural resources and poverty and global health and so on and so forth. Uh, but if we fail to solve AI alignment so that AI wants something different with the world, compared to uh, what what we desire, then we are in for catastrophe, because that's going to create a situation uh, where the AI wants the atoms of the world uh, for something different. And if it's more capable than us, then almost by definition, uh, it will almost certainly uh, beat us in this competition uh, for resources, resources. So solving AI alignment is an absolute necessity if we are to run ahead and create super capable AI. 
And I think that that is where we are heading on the current trajectory, the creation of such enormously intelligent AI. But I'm worried that we are not on track uh, towards solving AI alignment on time. No. And, uh, and we talk about, now we're t since we're talking about AI alignment, um, for me, uh, I think it's interesting. You, you said that we should, you prefer to talk about something called transformative AI. But uh, when I think about AI alignment, uh, it seems to me that letting an AI alignment, uh, an AI, um, I mean, not focusing on it properly um, makes us unprepared. Uh, it's like potentially letting go of an unstoppable monster into the world and that could potentially threat uh, humanity again. Again, like uh, Yugovsky said, that it's not because it's inherently evil, but the, the AI, but just because it may have other goals and methods to reach those goals that happens to be incompa incompatible with the uh, humans continuing to exist on this planet. So do you agree? Uh, and if so, how can we work towards AI al alignment, which seems uh, to be neglected uh, a lot today? Yeah, so the latest estimates I've heard about the number of AI safety and AI alignment uh, researchers around the world counts in a few hundred, maybe three, four, perhaps 600 researchers. And that is so little compared to the tens of thousands uh, of, of uh, AI capabilities uh, researchers. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, AI alignment is really lagging behind. Uh, it's not that there aren't any ideas about uh, how to uh, move forward uh, on AI alignment, uh, but no one has yet presented a plan that convincingly shows that uh, this is going to work. Um, the uh, most commonly used um, alignment-like method in practice is what is called reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is what OpenAI and some of these other leading companies uh, are using to try to uh, tame their uh, large language models and and prevent them from from saying bad things prevent them from saying racist and sexist things and prevent them from helping users do uh, criminal or immoral acts if you ask um, chat gpt uh, how to hotwire a car or how to cook methamphetamine or whatever uh, OpenAI wants ChatGPT to refuse those kinds of, of, of uh, 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 helping with, with uh, illegal things. And this is done with uh, this RLHF uh, technology, reinforcement learning with human feedback, where basically you have lots and lots of human users uh, responding to uh, different um, answers given by chat gpt in various com concepts by giving thumbs up or thumbs down de depending on whether uh, the answers are in line with the restrictions that open ai want to have in terms of not saying bad things and so on and so forth and uh, this is a methodology that has had some success it's not full success because uh, we've seen lots and lots of examples of, of uh, ChatGPT and other large language models uh, breaking these rules. Uh, there is something called jailbreaking, which has come, became last early last year something of a popular sport where you employed various tricks. Users employed various tricks to to get uh, ChatGPT to to break these rules. But more importantly, it is fairly well understood by now in the AI safety community that this method uh, is not going to work uh, as we uh, start getting uh, superhumanly um, uh, capable uh, AIs. 
And in particular, it's not going to work uh, when uh, AIs reach the level of situational awareness uh, and, and, and other um, uh, capabilities uh, that makes it understand when and when not it can deceive us. And, and, and this seems to be uh, a huge obstacle to this particular alignment uh, methodology. So we need other things. Other things are on the table. But all of them have problems with this uh, deception thing, which we have already seen small signs of in, in, in uh, various examples of applica and applications of these uh, large uh, language models. People have done computer experiments where, where they have where they can see this type of uh, deceptive behavior. So we need to figure out something else. Uh, and there's really nothing, there's no foolproof plan on the table. And we are even at the point where OpenAI, uh, um, sometime, I think this, Last summer, or maybe in September last year, they launched this uh, super alignment project where they uh, aspire to solve the AI alignment problem in such a way as to work all the way up to AGI and, and uh, super uh, humanly capable AIs. And their main idea is this. Okay. Alignment seems really, really hard for us humans. So how about if we create an AI that is smarter than us at solving this problem and it can solve the, solve the problem for us? So in short, we are worried about what highly advanced AI can do. So we create a highly advanced AI to solve the alignment problem for us. This could work. But it's a huge leap out in the dark. Uh, and and uh, it's very, very easy to imagine this failing in, in spectacular ways. But OpenAI have given themselves a deadline of four years into the future. This was done in 2023. So this means that they are hoping to finish this by 2027. And that also gives a sign of uh, what kinds of timetables they have for uh, the emergence of what they think may be uh, dangerously uh, capable AIs. This is a very, very worrying uh, situation. And uh, this is also why, if you read the first edition of my book from 2021, all my focus in solving this problem was putting more resources into AI alignment and, and trying harder to, to solve this problem. Uh, but I was quite dismissive of the other approach, which would be to slow down AI development. We have this like a kind of a race between on one hand AI capabilities going faster and faster, and on the other hand, AI alignment trying to catch up. And if we reach super intelligent AI on the capability side before AI alignment has been solved, then we are really, really in trouble. So I was pushing for doing AI alignment faster, but I said it's naive to try and slow down the, the um, uh, AI capabilities part. But since then, I and many others have changed our mind and think that the situation is now so urgent and so dire that with the current speed at which uh, AI capabilities is, is developing, there really isn't most likely enough time uh, to, to um, solve the AI alignment problem. We need more time for that, and therefore we need the leading AI companies. OpenAI, um, Google DeepMind, uh, Anthropic, and maybe a few others okay. to pull the brakes to slow down, to, to give AI alignment a, a chance to catch up and, and, and uh, really ha have the chance to, to create a happy ending to, to this. Uh, I mean, it's really a magnificent uh, idea to create 
superhumanly capable intelligence. I think that it, it's it's the in some sense the greatest project in in the history of humanity. But if we don't solve AI alignment, it might also be the very last thing we do. I completely agree, and uh, it kind of it's um, this is a good bridge to my next question because. Uh, as we talk about AI, as I see it right now, uh, it's, it's kind of an AI arms race, if you will. It's a, it's a competition of, um, you know, who can be have the most powerful, the most um, profitable and the, uh, able AI to be used, obviously, to, to sell different products and so on, but also for military use, for, for, the, for police and so on in the future. And with this in mind, we have, as you mentioned, you, you can have one or two, three actors, um, you know, uh, playing by the books, so to speak, uh, in line with the AI alignment, hopefully, as you said, uh, and work towards something good. Uh, but we may have a couple of actors that uh, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, because of this kind of competition, um, they are, you know, you're recording uh, um, text you you're recording videos around the world and so on but how how can we is it possible to kind of uh, create something that could decrease the risks since there's so many actors now sort of in the same race to do it in the short term is not so complicated because there are only a few actors that are at the frontier of of, of uh, ai development so it doesn't sound impossible to me to coordinate like three or four or five AI companies in slowing down. Uh, but this is not going to solve the problem forever because uh, others would catch up. And uh, what you always hear when you talk about these slowdowns is someone says, okay, let's suppose that we good guys in the West uh, uh, pause these, this, this very uh, dangerous AI development. What about China then? And, and, uh, and they say that as if that's a conversation stopper and, and, and that it clearly shows the um, uh, naiveness uh, of asking for an AI slowdown. But I think that you cannot just assume that China would be uh, happy to move forward and endanger the entire world uh, in a situation where the United States and, and, and the rest of the West uh, joins uh, on, on pausing this development. And in fact, if you look at uh, uh, AI regulations in various countries, uh, China tends to have tougher regulations of its tech sectors. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party are actually quite uh, worried about uh, radical change. And, and uh, one way to phrase this uh, is in terms of, well, they simply don't want uh, uh, the creation of an AI that would be more powerful than Xi Jinping. Uh, so to just assume that you cannot get China on board uh, with an international agreement, which I think is what we need to be looking for to slow down AI, is, I think, uh, an overly pessimistic uh, view of our international relations and with China in particular. None of this is going to be easy. Uh, and and, and uh, I think we're all frustrated about how slow progress is going on on the climate side uh, despite uh, these enormous efforts to create uh, binding and strong international agreements and and th this is likely not going to be a whole lot easier on the ai side but it's not impossible and it's uh, something that i think we absol absolutely should try Another aspect is uh, something that I thought about a lot when I read about it in Nick Bostrom's book, um, Superintelligence. It talks about something called the singleton, or a, you could call it an AI god or something, a superior AI 
that would be able to anticipate it reaches a level of we call it super intelligence it's uh, you know uh, beyond the, the collective intelligence of the humanity and it's also beyond any other ai at the moment other uh, advanced ai or so and uh, at that from that moment on it could um, develop into you know step by step into you know ai singularity or a very 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 advanced ai that could stop other ais from develop if it shows to do so and humanity. It's uh, of course a tricky question, but if you look at, at what's happening now, as I mentioned with OpenAI and ChatGPT4 and ChatGPT5 coming and other companies and so on, do you see this development as a risk now? Has it, has it increased, and si increased since the last time we, we talked? Or do you think still it's something maybe uh, we can avoid? It is something we can avoid, but we need to pull ourselves <laughs> together collectively humanity, uh, because uh, avoidance is not going to uh, happen automatically. Uh, we, we, if, if we lean back and just watch what happens uh, without um, taking, making conscious interventions, I think that this, this uh, crazy race between the leading um, AI companies is just going to uh, continue. And, and, and that's not going to end well. And there's a lot of mechanisms uh, that, that uh, support that conclusion. For instance, just the fact that the more uh, you are in a hurry to beat uh, your competitors, the less time you, you have to think about safety and uh, ethics and social consequences uh, and, and such stuff. So the faster this race is going, the uh, less time uh, do these companies have to actually work out the necessary safety and uh, alignment stuff for this to, to, to get a good ending. When comparing the situation now to, to the one in 2021, when last time we had this conversation, I would say that the risk has gone up, but mo more than anything else, it has become more urgent. Mm. I was still in a mindset where I thought that the uh, crucial events that could lead either to a kind of utopia with an aligned superintelligent AI that can solve all the problems or to human destruction. I was still uh, uh, thinking that this is probably at least decades away. Yeah, I no longer think this. That's now right. I worry that that um, uh, relatives uh, of, of, of mine who, who uh, recently had a baby, that this baby might not even get the chance to grow up to, to, to begin school because uh, an AI catastrophe comes between. This is really, really worrying, but that's the kind of the time frame uh, that, that, that we're looking at right now. I cannot tell for sure. I cannot give you an exact uh, timeline because uncertainties are very large, but we can no longer longer discount the risk that um, the final AI catastrophe happens before the turn of, of the present decade. Yes, so uh, we have uh, covered a lot of things, a lot of uh, aspects of AI risks. And finally, I would like to briefly also talk about something I fear might happen with increased use of AI applications and more advanced AI systems. Our previous guest, uh, Arthur Berman, talked about an, a potential imminent decline of oil and natural gas production in the world. And uh, something that relates to that is what can happen if we optimize our with AI, with, which increased AI uh, use it may lead to um, yeah, Gevon's paradox, uh, potentially. I mean, optimization uh, to, that also increase, increases the accessibility for different resources, but also optimization of extract, extraction per se. So how do you see that AI could increase the risk of simply using too much resources even faster? So oh, there have been uh, some concern in some uh quarters of the AI discussion in recent years about the energy consumption 
uh, involved in training of these uh, biggest uh, AI models. Uh, <clears throat> but if you look at the, uh, so they talk about this, the, the contribution to, to global uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But where we are now, these um, uh, emissions, when you look at it from a global perspective, are, are not large at all. It's the training of GPT-4 uh, is uh, re required an amount of electricity, which I cannot say exactly how much it was, but it was on the order of magnitude of a small Swedish village uh, electricity consumption uh, over one year. So, 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 so given what an influential product GPT-4 is, I don't think that that's much. But, but this is increasing. It's increasing exponentially. We have maybe a doubling of energy consumption uh, per year or something like that. If you look at these types of, of um, uh, AI products, and anything that that uh, grows exponentially will become very big over time and uh, a doubling uh, per year that's like a thousand fold increase per decade and so on so so if if, if this continues uh it, it could uh, quickly uh, become a problem still i don't think that this is quite the most relevant way to look at things i'd i'd, I'd rather, i think that the really big risk is when we uh, create uh, uh, superhumanly a powerful AI that, uh, I mean, if it's unaligned and if it takes over the world and if it uses the world for its its own non-human purposes, that's probably going to entirely destroy the whole biosphere. And I think that that's the ultimate environmental problem. And it's the one that we mainly should focus on. And this is not just a theoretical issue, because if you have the former perspective, if you worry about the amount of electricity consumption in, in, in the training of GPT-5 and GPT-6 and so on, then you're easily led to the idea that, okay, but if we can only make AI more energy efficient to make the chips that, that the AI runs on more efficient, we, we're helping the environment. I think it works the other way around. I think that these leading uh, tech companies are going to buy all the electricity uh, and and, uh, and uh, chips and so on that they can afford. And if we make these products more efficient, they're just going to 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 buy more of it, and we're going to get AI even faster. So I have a lot of colleagues uh, in AI research who talk about their work on making AI more efficient and how environmentally friendly that is. And I just don't like the framing of that. I worry that this is just going to accelerate AI development and possibly lead to uh, a, a global catastrophe faster than we have previously um, worried about. I completely agree and we have talked and covered so much already and uh, takes, thanks for all the patience with some technical er errors but we'll continue the next conversation uh, and then part two will uh, focus on something you talk about frequently uh, it's called open AI's preparedness framework how they look at the AI risks and the, what they have in plan uh, for that, and which is also very important, obviously, as they are considered a, a leader in the AI uh, world. So, thank you very much, Johan. I look forward to yes, that. Yes, thank you. That was all for today, folks. Share what you think in the comment section below. And if you liked the episode, don't forget, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Next up is part two of my conversation with Professor Ole Hegström. We dig deeper into AI risks and talk about open AI's so-called AI preparedness framework. What we need to do to increase the probability of a good outcome for humanity as artificial intelligence becomes more and more capable and even superior to human intelligence. I hope to see you next time.